Okay guys, welcome back. This is going to be uh, session 18 in our look at uh, general, a general approach to apologetics. We're right now in the middle of looking at the doctrine of biblical creation. And um, we noted that the biblical creationist and the atheistic evolutionist, uh, they both claim to have science on, as their ally. Uh, but we're asking ourselves, what are, the pre what are the necessary preconditions for scientific investigation? Uh, what, what needs to be true about the world and about yourself uh, so that you can actually go out and do science? And we looked at several things. The last thing we just looked at um, was uh, the objective, the existence of classes. Uh, the borders and content of classes of things that actually exist um, need to be established objectively, right? A class of beings called humans and a class called non-human beings. The borders and the content of classes need to be uh, in existence and we need to get our minds uh, to be thinking thoughts that are congruent with the objective existence of classes, these organizing principles called classes. Uh, and we noted that guys like Richard Dawkins, Lee Silver, and P.Z. Myers, uh, their comments sound monistic. Uh, they sound as though there is no real objective and certain place to draw distinctions between anything. And of course, that, that is gonna undercut the, the validity of all reason. I mean, if there, is, if there are no distinctions objectively in reality, how can you say that your, any of your thoughts, any of the rational discriminations you want to make, uh, how can you say that they are getting you anywhere near the truth then? How can you even have error? How could you have false beliefs? You, right there to say that belief is true and that belief is false is to draw a distinction. But if all distinctions are illusory or just merely conventional, then you're not saying anything <laughs> when you say that belief isn't true. Right? You've got to have real distinction and real unity here uh, for the universe to be intelligible. I think you've got to have it. Um, and, but again, atheistic evolution sounds, um, it sounds monistic and it sounds like uh, oneness and individuality uh, don't really exist. Oneness, yes, individuality, no. Or distinctions, no. Uh, number five, real quick, there has to be uh, prescriptive standards of thinking. There has to be, I mean, there has to be a right way to think. That's pretty easy to say. There has to be a right way for us to think. Talk about, that, that guy over there, he's, he's thinking very rational, right? He's being a rational person right now. And that, that lady there, boy, she's irrational. How do you know? <laughs> if thoughts are just molecules bumping against each other in a physical brain, and all of this is happening in accordance with the laws of physics and chemistry, then how, how would you discern whether one brain state was a rational brain state over, a different, over another, another brain state? Or the thoughts being produced by those brain states? How could you ever evaluate if one was being rational and the other irrational? Uh, you need laws of logic. You need prescriptive standards of thinking. Where would prescriptive standards of thinking come from? Where would, how would you account for them? They, they appear to be real, they exist. We correct each other in our thinking when we feel the other person isn't being rational. What is the standard we're holding them to? Where'd it come from? And the Christian has a ready answer. Well, God establishes the rules of right thinking, <laughs> of course. But if you're an atheistic evolutionist, it would be pretty hard to um, to account for these prescriptive universal invariant laws of thought, called, called the laws of logic. Uh, number six, generally reliable rational faculties. You gotta, not only does there have to be prescriptive standards of thinking, but you have to have the kind of mind that's in contact with those standards and is obeying them. You're, you're actually thinking thoughts that are in congruence with those standards. You have to kind of believe that. But how, how do you have any, first of all, how do you have knowledge of these things? They're abstract entities. How did they, how did you ever come to know the laws of logic? That's number one. Number two, how is it that your brain is perfectly adapted, this physical brain, how is it adapted to think thoughts that are congruent with those abstract laws? Very hard to explain, I think, in an atheist universe. Uh, yet if you, if you trust your Bible, uh, the Bible says that it's God that's put wisdom in the inward parts. He has given understanding to the heart or mind. Uh, it is God that teaches man knowledge, and in Christ are deposited or hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
So this is the subject of our debate on Saturday. Uh, you cannot understand this world without God. And again, my worldview doesn't require that a person pray to God or confess that God exists or go to church. You don't have to do any of those things. You can, you can verbally deny that God exists. But on my worldview, it's God's actual existence that makes that denial intelligible in the first place. You couldn't fight against God intellectually if God didn't provide the preconditions for that argument that you're trying to make. See, that's my view. And um, well, Darwin himself had some serious doubts about his own rational capabilities. Uh, this is what he said. He said, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are at any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? See, he's barking up a very interesting tree there. I think he's, he's having a moment of clarity of thought. He's, he's thinking, wait just a minute here. If the laws of physics and chemistry are solely respond, I mean, the laws of physics and chemistry operating on uh, physical and chemical um, beings, we'll say, if that's all there is to me, then how can, I th how can I really think that anything that I'm thinking is actually true? You're getting the picture, right? Um, what would a belief be anyways? In, on an, if, you're a, if you're an atheistic materialist, a Darwinist, what would a belief be? A belief would be something like a, no a long-standing neural event. It would just be electrical, chemical reactions in this physical brain, right? That's all that a belief would, would amount to. So electrical, chemical events involving the nervous system, and voila, you've got a belief. And that belief is true or false. But think about other events, other, uh, you know, physical events involving the nervous system. Are, are they true or false? I mean, do you have a toothache that's more true than another toothache? That's a silly sort of thing, isn't it? Is one itch, is your itch truer than the toothache? How can, some, how can one brain state be truer than some other brain state? Especially if the whole thing just got here by random chance. Just physics and chemistry, you know. Time, chance, energy, matter, all jumbled together. Voila, hey, you've got a brain state that's true. This is hard, I think. <laughs> I have a hard time with this. Francis Crick said, our highly developed brains, after all, were not evolved under the pressure of discovering scientific truths, but only to enable us to be clever enough to survive and leave descendants. How about that? Your brain, says Crick, was not evolved to, it was not evolved to learn true things. It's all, all it matters is that your brain is doing what it needs to do to get your body into the right place, doing the right thing so that it can survive. Now, if you, if you really believe that, what justification do you have for thinking anything that you believe is actually true? See? Steven Pinker said, our brains are shaped for fitness, not for truth. Sometimes truth is adaptive, sometimes it's not. The materialist Patricia Churchland, she said this, boiled down to essentials, a nervous system enables the organism to succeed in feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. The principal chore of the nervous system is to get the body parts where they should be in order to, that the organism may survive. Improvements in sensuomotor control con confer an evolutionary advantage. A fancier style of representing is it advantageous so long as it is geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chances for survival. Truth, whatever that is, takes the hindmost. So you understand how uh, a commitment to Darwinism actually begins to undercut the validity of all reason and starts to call into question whether or not humans generally have true beliefs. It, it calls it into serious question. Yes, your brain is doing what it needs to do for, for your body to survive, but what about the content of your beliefs? Assuming your brain could even have content. I find that hard to believe. A physical thing has content, informational content, really? I mean, that's another thing. There's a whole other issue there. Uh, the validity and applicability of mathematics, uh, you, you also have, have to recognize that. And again, just like the laws of logic, where would the laws of math and numbers come from? Where, what are numbers? Are they real? Are they conceptual? What are the laws that govern their treatment? What's the nature of these things? How is it that 
math and numbers, which appear to be mental, how is it they apply so beautifully to the changing physical world in which we live? Yet they must, if we're going to go, go out and do science. You, be, you need to be able to idealize the world mathematically. Uh, so you have these six preconditions for uh, scientific investigation here. Uh, and God provides for these things. Christian theism, I think, provides the preconditions or presuppositions of rational inquiry. Uh, and therefore, Christian theism is proven true by the impossibility of the contrary. If you're going to use these things that only God can account for, um, then you're sort of proving to me that God exists. Right? If you're going to say God doesn't exist, then all these things are left unaccounted for. In fact, they seem to be unintelligible. I don't know what a law of logic would be. What would a prescriptive universal law of logic be without God? It would be hard, I think, to explain that, to justify that, um, account for it, right? Um, okay, does that all make sense? Go home and think about it. You know? Feel free to ask questions. I know that I sort of rove right through the entire time we have together talking, but at any time you want to make a comment or ask a question or issue a challenge, don't see me like some kind of bully, okay? <laughs> We can talk about it, and I won't, I won't say, hey, that's a stupid thing you just said. Shut up and listen to the teacher. I won't talk like that to you, okay? How about some rebuttals here? You can, uh, you can give all this information to the Darwinist, and um, he, may, he may understand it, he might not understand it, it may take some time. You guys, you're already seasoned veterans in this class, right? Some of this is review. It may take some time, okay? But if you're talking to a diehard um, Darwinist who wants to defend his Darwinism, he has some stock answers he's going to give you. And this is one of them. This is a very common one. Perhaps it's the most common one. They're going to say that evolution makes predictions. And they'll, they'll tell you what some of, the, some of them are. And they're going to show you that evolution is successful in its predictions. And therefore, evolution is true. Evolution predicts X. X has been found. Evolution, therefore, is true. They'll give you an argument like this. Evolution predicts similarities between different animal kinds. Similarities between animal kinds has been discovered, therefore evolution is true. Okay. Many things like that. First of all, does everyone understand the evolutionist's argument here? Okay. How, how might we answer an argument like that? I think the very first thing we need to ask these guys is to, again, back up and ask the question, which worldview accounts for predictability in the first place? Very, very important. Don't just get lost. This is something you guys need to avoid right now. He presents you with a scientific argument. Look at what science has discovered. We predicted this and now we've discovered it. Okay, fine. I'd love to talk to you about that and we will talk together about this. But I need to know, I need to back up and ask you about your worldview. Does your worldview make sense out of you predicting anything? Not really, not if you're a Darwinist. You need to ask him, are facts causally connected? How do you know? How do you know any of the facts of the universe that you encounter are actually causally connected to each other? How, how do they correspond to each other? Explain correspondence. And how do you know this won't change? How do you know that's happening right now? How do you know it won't change in the future? How do you know it happened in the past? Uh, in a non-Christian world, we just saw this, chance is ultimate. Law-like regularity is, can't be guaranteed. And if law-like regularity can't be guaranteed, you have no business making predictions about anything. It's a Christian worldview uh, that provides the preconditions for you predicting things. You know, you have God who knows everything, who made the world. He says, you can reason inductively. You can make predictions about tomorrow, about what will happen tomorrow, based on what you see today. God says, you can do that. I say, thank you, Father, I will. But if I was a Darwinist, or if I were a Darwinist, and I had a worldview in which chance was ultimate and law like regularity could not be guaranteed, why would I predict anything? You know, why, why would I even do that? And even if I did predict something and that prediction was fulfilled, it could have been blind random chance that it caused the fulfillment. It doesn't prove anything in a chance universe, does it? So that's number one, very important. Number two, uh, there's a fallacy here. This is called the fallacy of affirming the consequent. Okay? A valid argument looks like this. It's on the left. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. Premise one, if P, then Q. Premise two, P. 
It is the case. P is the case. Whatever that, whatever P is, whatever. If P is the case, then Q is the case. P is the case. Therefore, conclusion: Q must be the case. That is a valid argument structure right there. But look at look at the invalid structure here. If P, then Q. That's the first. If P is the case, then Q is the case. Okay. Premise two: Q is the case. Conclusion, therefore, now we know that P is the case. That is not valid. That's called affirming the consequent. Anyone ever see this before? Yeah. You say, um, if it rained last night, the streets will be wet. And then premise two, the streets are wet. Can I conclude it rained last night? No, the fire hydrant may have ruptured. Maybe my neighbor is washing his car or something. You just can't know. Now, if I said uh, something like, uh, uh, if I was to narrow the options, I would say, if, it, if and only if it rained last night, the streets will be wet. Uh, and, then, and then I say the streets were wet. Well, then, OK, it rained last night. But that's not, that's not the nature of the argument here. So just, we're just saying, if P, then Q, Q, therefore P. No way. There may be other things that will account for, um, for Q. And again, I go back to this prediction here. If evolution is true, then animals will share similarities. Animals share similarities, therefore evolution is true. So this is supposed to be evidence of common ancestry. I can turn around and, and give the exact same parallel argument. If creation is true, then animals will share similarities. Animals share similarities, then, then, then creation is true. Evidence of a common designer. See? It, this is tit for tat here. This is parallel. This is a parallel thing that, that we're doing. So that's, that's number one uh, regarding predictions. Number two, uh, oftentimes, oftentimes, the, the uh, Darwinist will reify, reification. Reification is where you take an abstract con a concept and you treat it as though it's some, something concrete that can do things. Conscious agency, some, they talk about evolution, like evolution is a thing that's like a person that's doing things. Evolution, look at evolution designed. Evolution experimented with different kind of body plans until it came up with a design that worked. They talk like that. They reify. Uh, Mike, remember Mike Shermer? Ironically, we were designed by evolution to, f to find design in nature. He almost, sound, almost sounds like evolution were a god that was doing things. Intentionality behind uh, what it's doing. Uh, this is from National Geographic magazine t uh, speaking about the gecko's amazing feet. For the present, people cannot hope to reproduce such intricate nanopuzzles. Nature, however, assembles them effortless, effortlessly, molecule by molecule, following the recipe for complexity encoded in the DNA. So nature becomes some kind of a god now. Nature is a conscious agent assembling things and following a recipe. Now, my wife is going to bake a whole whack of pies here for the debate on Saturday, and my wife is going to be following a recipe as she does that. But see, she's a conscious, a conscious, intelligent agent. And here, nature is being reified to be some sort of, see, that's a lots of logical fallacy. George Wald said uh, regarding evolution, time is, is, is in fact the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. Time almost becomes a, um, a conscious active agent. Lee Silver said, this selective process, regarding the environment now, see, this selective process is carried out by the environment that's going to say, this, or, this animal or this plant has certain genes which give it a better chance of surviving and reproducing. It's going to survive and everything else dies. And the same process is repeated over and over again. Uh, the environment's going to say that. <laughs> really? Jerry Coyne, in his book, Why Evolution is True, natural selection, he, he seems to treat like a conscious agent. Despite the unknowns, we can make some guesses about how natural selection fashioned modern birds. Charles Darwin is the guy that re really reified, I think. Natural selection, he says, natural selection shall hereafter see, we shall hereafter see, is a power incessantly ready for action. Individual differences are of the highest importance for us for they are often inherited, as must be familiar to everyone, 
and thus afforded materials for natural selection to act on and accumulate in the same manner as a man accumulates in any given direction individual differences in his domesticated productions. That's very clear to me. Uh, he has got natural selection as an animal breeder in the same manner as man accumulates in any given direction individual differences in his domesticated productions. Now, I want to be fair. Let's be fair to people. You can speak in figurative language um, and, not, and not reify, okay? In some of these quotations, there's a spectrum here, I think, where a guy is just speaking generally and he's, um, he's not really trying to deify or reify uh, non-personal things. We allow for that. And I think that it's sometimes not clear where reification is actually happening. But in some places, it's, it is kind of clear, right? And I think in this one here with Darwin, he does seem to treat natural, natural selection like a, like a conscious agent, okay? So just watch out for that. Um, and let's not be unfair to people. Don't jump all over people if they seem, if maybe they're just speaking figuratively and generally, okay? But if it sounds to you like, boy, this guy really is reifying right now, then you call him on it. That's a fallacy. It gets a logical fallacy. Um, but here, whoop. Uh, Yep, people calling me. Um, where was I here? Oh yes, uh, fallacy of reification. With Darwin, I think he really is uh, committing that fallacy and something else, he's, there's, a, there's a fallacy called false analogy. And I think in evolution, we're getting both of those things. Now watch this very carefully. A fallacy of false analogy is a fallacy in which an argument is based on misleading, superficial, or implausible comparisons. And you do see this here, now watch. National Geographic magazine, all about the evolution of the dog. Um, and it's pretty quite, quite amazing, the variety within the dog kind. See that little shorty there? And he's underneath the legs of this gigantic thing, like a St. Bernard or something. Uh, and this is what the article says. Now watch the article. For reasons both practical and whimsical, man's best friend has been artificially evolved into the most diverse animal on the planet. A staggering achievement, given that uh, given that most of the 350 to 400 dog breeds in existence have only been around for a couple hundred years. The breeders fast forwarded the normal pace of evolution by combining traits of desperate dogs and accentuating them by breeding those offspring with the largest hints of the desired attributes. Uh, look at the quote there very carefully. Breeders have fast forwarded the normal pace of evolution because they, they were selectively breeding these dogs. I want, huge, I want a huge dog, I'll just keep breeding the biggest dogs. And they say that when, when breeders did that, they fast forwarded the normal pace of evolution. And um, well, watch how they did it. Sheltered from the survival of the fittest wilderness, those semi-domesticated dogs thrived even though they harbored deleterious genetic mutations. Stumpy legs, for instance, would have been weeded out in smaller wild populations. Thousands of years later, breeders would seize upon that diverse raw material when they began creating modern breeds. Now let's think it very carefully, think it through. The article says that breeders fast forwarded the pace of evolution by selecting dogs with the traits they liked. But they're telling us that the mutations that they protected were deleterious and they would have been destroyed had those dogs been left in the wilderness. Now my question is, how can preserving what nature destroys be described as speeding up a natural process? You got that figured? We did something with those dogs to produce all kinds of neat varieties that nature would have never done. So that we did not speed up the pace of evolution. Uh, we stepped in and changed things altogether, right? So, so when Darwin says, nature is doing what we do, nature is a, a, um, or natural selection is an animal breeder, that is a false analogy. Natural selection would not produce stumpy leg dogs and so on, and all these deleterious mutations, these mutant dogs. We just read it. And so in this one National Geographical article, you get this um, contradictory statements. Right? Watch out for those things. See, you don't have to argue fossils and rocks and 
and complex biology, you can just watch out for the fallacies and call the guy on it, you know? Next class will be our last class on creation and we will get into some biology. We will look at evidence, I think, for the flood and those, those sorts of things. But right now, we're, argue, we're talking about arguing with an evolutionist. Let's get down to the rules of proper arguing, at least, right? And you can call him when he's not engaging uh, properly here. Uh, begging the question is another fallacy. It's when you argue in a circle. A logical fallacy in which the writer or speaker assumes the statement under examination to be true. Yeah, you're coming into this thing, uh, and you say, I'm going to, I believe that X is true, and I'm going, to defend my, I'm going to defend my position here today that X is true. Uh, and then you turn around and you say, X is true because X is true. Okay. That, that's my evidence for you. That's my argument. Well, that's just begging the question. But begging the question can be um, not so easily detected. You've got to watch out for it, arguing in a circle. The most basic instances of begging the question involve rephrasing. In these examples, the statement following because just restates the initial proposition in different or abstract terms. See, watch. See, first one. Freedom of, freedom of speech is important. Why? Because people should be able to speak freely. You just, you just went in a circle. <laughs> Why is freedom of speech important? Oh, it's important because people should be able to speak freely. The death penalty is wrong. Why? Because killing people is immoral. <laughs> you see that? Just begging the question. You use different terms to say the exact same thing. Ghosts are real because I have, ex have had experiences with them myself. You, now you're just assuming that the, your, the experience you had was with a ghost, right? You haven't shown me that that experience really was with a ghost. That's what you'd have to do, right? And you need to watch out for this because the evolutionist community do this all the time. Evolution is true because it is documented in the fossil record. You ever see that one? Evolution is true because it's documented in the fossil record. No. The fossil record is just a bunch of bones in the dirt. And you're interpreting those bones as though evolution were true. Those rocks and fossils don't talk to us. <laughs> they just sit there in the dirt. And we come to them and we superimpose meaning upon them. And the, the meaning that the evolutionist imposes upon those rocks and fossils is that evolution has happened. So that is circular reasoning to say it is documented in the fossil record. Evolution is true because we have found fossil missing links. Again, I mean, you're just, if evolution is not true, then those are not missing links. Yes, you found some fossils. Those might be just fossil chimps. They may not be our ancestors. It, you have to assume evolution is true to recognize something as a missing link. Remember? Apes, humans, links in between, right? If that story is true, that creature you found might be a link, might be a missing link. But the whole, the whole idea here is, is evolution true? So to say that you found missing links is to assume evolution is true. Apes are our distant relatives. Well, of course, that's, that's obviously circular, right? We hear this all the time, though. We know evolution is true because apes are our relatives. How about this one? Uh, evolution is true because animals have vestigial structures. Do anyone know what a vestigial structure is? It's a vestigial structure is uh, an anatomical feature that is supposed to be an evolutionary leftover. It's something in your body that doesn't serve any purpose anymore. It used to in the remote past, but throughout endless ages of time as we evolved, that thing lost its function. Okay. It's only a vestigial structure if evolution is true though. Right? You label the appendix a vestigial structure, that means you assume evolution. Okay. Uh, I look at the appendix and I don't see a vestigial structure. I see something God put there for a purpose. Turns out the thing is very, very instrumental in our immune system. But we even, even if we couldn't find a function for it readily, that still doesn't mean it's necessarily a, a vestige. It doesn't mean that it's vestigial. It just means you have a mysterious structure there. Okay? But I think we can falsify evolution. Uh, and I, I want to give you some things that I, that I think falsify. Now, I want you to hear this very carefully, okay? 
I once took a course at CMU, Evolution, Creation, and the Bible. The two professors that taught the course were both evolutionists. And they were pretty near Darwinists. They said they were Christians. But when they, gave, when they talked theology, they sound like non-believers completely. It was incredible. I mean, the one guy actually says, the new heavens and the new earth will evolve peacefully into existence. And he says, yeah, my view is not very biblical, but that's what I believe. He actually tells the class this. Uh, and then he says, uh, can you really believe that God created in six days? I mean, come on. Is God that much of an interventionist? He's not in my life. And I, and I was like, he is in mine. I walk with him every day. <laughs> He's an interventionist in my life. He holds the world together, right? Um, yeah, they, and there, he talked about trial and error. Evolution is a system of trial and error. Does God make errors? No, God knows everything. He makes it right the first time, right? Um, but I, see, I approached him and I said, I said, you, you sir, you, you're a religionist, all right. This is um, a blind religious faith commitment to evolution. You, you, this, is, this is religiously held to standard of truth. This is religion. I said, I told him, you cannot falsify evolution. No matter what you find, you'll reinterpret it in the light of evolution, because that's taken as a presupposition. And he assured me he, that that's not what he was doing. He assured me and the class that you could falsify evolution, and then therefore you'd have to abandon it as a theory, right? And this is what he said. He said, um, if you have divergent phylogenetic trees, you would falsify evolution. Okay, so what's a phylogenetic tree? This is the Darwin tree of life. Single cell organism at the bottom in the remote past. And look how the branches contain at their ends different life forms. See that? Now we draw this tree of family relationship based on two things. First, how these things look. What is the anatomy of this creature? What's its body plan? We draw a tree based on that. He told me, if the tree that you draw based on how these things look, if that tree does not line up with the tree based on genetics, the molecular data, uh, protein coding and all this kind of stuff, protein structure, if those two trees don't line up, you falsified evolution. And I promptly <laughs> came the next, next class with a, a maybe 12 or so quotations from science journals that say those trees don't line up. And do you think he gave up evolution? Of course not. I'll give you just a couple quotes here. Science Magazine, 1998. Animal relationships derived from these new molecular data sometimes are very different from those implied by older classical evaluations of morphology. Reconciling these differences is a central challenge for evolutionary biologists at present. Science Daily, 1999. Looking deep within the genes of these three very different kinds of animals, for more than 100 years, scientists have depended on morphology, that's how they look, to form the structure of animals, the form and structure of animals to determine their place on the family tree. But over the past few years, a new tree has been proposed based on comparisons of themes found in animal genes. In the last four or five years, this tree has been totally reorganized. And if you're interested in evolutionary relationships, that's really important. Uh, and this, this quote here from Michael Denton, uh, he writes this, there is little doubt that if this molecular evidence had been available a century ago, the idea of organic evolution might never have been accepted. And, and I, believe me, I have a mountain of quotations like that. I'm just really truncating this for this short class, but it's very clear. These two trees do, do not line up. Uh, and this professor obviously wasn't aware of that. But I presented to him the data, a mountain of it. He's not going to give up his evolution. It all gets reinterpreted. Evolution is the one thing. It's kind of like this, you guys. Imagine a castle, a medieval castle, okay? And uh, in the heart of the castle is the queen. And you have all these soldiers with spears and shields and, and crossbows and stuff, right? And they need to protect the queen. Don't let people get to the queen. Uh, and those soldiers, they'll die to protect the queen. Don't let, whatever you do, you can let the... You can let, uh, if you have to, they can get into the building. The enemy can get into the building, but at no cost must they get to the queen. Evolution is like the queen. They'll give up all kinds of beliefs, the evolutionists will, except evolution. They'll, they'll revise anything in their worldview except evolution. See? 
Well, we can falsify evolution some more. Uh, for many years, we were examining the human genome and the genomes of other animals, and we noticed that in, in these long DNA sequences, it seemed to be short, relatively short stretches that actually coded for proteins to make the creature, right? And long stretches of, of DNA that did nothing. And the, the evolutionist community said, well, of course, you have long stretches of junk DNA that don't do anything. Animals have been cobbled together by chance and necessity, so you can have, you can have junk DNA. Well, it turns out the junk DNA is not junk. It's not coding for protein, but it acts as the operating system that regulates the coding protein regions. And, um, and that, that was discovered um, back in 2003, or, or thereabouts, in the early 2000s. They launched this project called the ENCODE project. And now we were finding out here what was damned as junk may uh, because it was not understood, may in fact turn out to be the very basis of human complexity. It's not junk at all. And it was the intelligent design advocates, uh, beginning like in the 80s and 90s, that said, we don't think it's junk. We think we're intelligently designed. Go, looking for, go look for a purpose for that stuff, because it's, it's there for a reason. And so the intelligent design people like ourselves, we were promoting science. We don't really, really don't understand what that's doing there. Let's do some science and figure it out. Evolutionist community said, that's junk, leave it alone. Now, which, you, know, you tell me, which group is being a promoter of science and which one is stifling scientific investigation, right? The really neat thing is that the junk DNA is not conserved. That's what the ENCODE project discovered. Surprisingly, many functional elements of the non-coding DNA are seemingly unconstrained, that is, not conserved across mammalian evolution. When we were, when we were looking at uh, humans and chimps, comparing us genetically, we're only looking at the pro protein coding regions of the genome. Now we're looking at the junk. Suppose a junk that's not junk, the real important stuff, the operating system, and now we're seeing big differences. I mean, this is, this, to me, this falsifies evolution. This was not predicted by the evolution story at all. Falsifying evolution, homologous structures. A homologous structure is just a structure that's similar between different animal kinds. The human has five digits on the forelimb, Five fingers. Don't show the middle one <laughs> to anybody. <laughs> and <laughs> the frog has five digits on his forelimb too. Now, if, we're, if this is because we have a common ancestry, then you'd expect that they would develop the same way, but they don't. The human's fingers develop because the cells between them die. Program cell death, and now you've got digits. The frog's five digits just grow straight out of the stump. Completely different developmental pathway. And in many places, different genes are coding for these similar structures. So if you've got, you got two animals, and they have, a, they have a very similar anatomical feature, you look at that and you say, oh, common ancestry. If that were true, then the genes that code for those structures should be the same. In many cases, they're not. And that's very, very interesting. That's not predict. That looks more like uh, intelligent design. God says, I want this creature to have this, fu this feature. I want this creature to also have that feature, but I'll code for them with different codes. And I almost think God did it just to show you these guys are not related. I almost think he did it just for that purpose, you know. But we have another problem. Sir Gavin De Beer says this, these genes as a manifestation of which the character develops must be continually changing. We were able to see how organs such as the eye, which are common to all vertebrate animals, preserve their essential similarity in structure or function, though the genes responsible for the organ must have become wholly altered during the evolutionary process. Are you getting that? You've got, you got an animal here with a, with a particular function, a, a particular anatomical feature with a function. And from that animal evolves some other animal, which also has that feature or an anatomical structure, one to the other. But we're told that somehow the genes that code for that feature in this guy have changed. How do you manage that? So you've got this guy with a particular gene uh, pattern that makes a particular function, 
and from him evolves this other guy. He's got the same anatomical feature, but the genes that code for that feature are totally different. How do you manage that? And it's a big problem here. This, this science textbook says this, biology uh, textbook. It says, it must be kept in mind that natural selection can only act on genetic variation when it is expressed as phenotype va variation. That is what you see. Genotype is the genetic stuff underneath, the code, the code pattern. He says, natural se selection can act on genetic variation only when it is expressed as phenotype variation. A completely recessive allele, never occurring in, in homozygous condition, would be totally masked from the action of natural selection. Now think about it. You got this organism with a particular anatomical feature. From him evolves a different organism uh, with the same feature. And somehow the genes get totally changed. But we are told that natural selection cannot just work on those genes. Natural selection works on what it can see, the animal's physical structure. So how do the genes change then, underlying that structure? Do you guys get the problem? That's a serious problem, I think. I think that's a serious problem. Here's another problem, falsifying evolution. If, you are, if you're a kind of creature that has a boatload of kids every generation, uh, and your gestational period is very, very uh, short, that means there's more chance for evolution to happen. There's more offspring. There's more chance for mutation to happen. Uh, if you're a creature with less offspring and long gestational periods, then there's less opportunity for evolution to happen, right? Less raw material there for mutations and, and so on. But think here, you, we start off as bacteria or something like that, single cell organisms like bacteria. And random mutations produce all this variety that you see here. And so we've created this geologic column, it's supposed to be a documentation in the rocks of this story. But notice the dates. They put dates to this stuff. This is supposed to be, this is the Earth history represented as a clock. Here's Earth history. Earth's been here for four and a half billion years. Roughly, okay? 25% of Earth history is lifeless. Nothing here. All of a sudden, single celled animals evolve on the scene. 62% of, of Earth history is nothing but protozoans living here, okay? This, this single celled animals, bacteria, and so on. Uh, and then comes for 13% metazoans. These are your, your animals, the th animals we're familiar with, you know, uh, metazoans, uh, multi-celled animals, including, and it's only 13%, including like the dinosaurs and everything else. Human evolution, the time that human, human evolution occurred is 0.002% of Earth history. But what I'm showing here is that we get this ridiculous blast of evolution in only 13% of Earth history, and what we have there are metazoans, multi-cell complex animals. 62% of Earth history is, is the protozoans, the single-celled animals, and um, well, these are the guys we expect to see a lot of evolution happening. Sh short gestational periods, boatloads of offspring. How come we didn't... How, how did we get all this crazy evolution to happen here in animals with relatively few offspring and long gestational periods. It's a strange correlation here. I think the supposed record of life is incongruent with the evolution story. Okay. I'll give you another one. Biological distribution. Um, whoops. Okay, here. East Asia, East North America. We, fe we see animal and plant kinds that are almost identical in these two places. Uh, different kinds of flowers, you, take, you look at the pictures, they look absolutely just about identical. And uh, wasps and millipedes and different fish and different, oh, 150 different seed plants, they look identical. What happened? The evolution story uh, is that uh, until about five million years ago, this was all connected. See? So, of course, you, you expect 
identical creatures to be living here. Five million years. This changed though, right? After five million years, or five million years ago, the split happened. Okay? So five, now you gotta think about it. Five million years, no evolutionary change in all those animals and plant kinds. But we are told in only four million years, we went from Artipithecus ramidus to a human being. That's a whole lot of evolution. In animals with relatively few offspring, longer gestational periods, uh, only four million years for that, and yet the, all those animals and plants, after five million years, didn't change a stitch. That, I, I think that's not predicted by the evolution story. <laughs> okay. Is that good? Uh, I have many more things we could talk about, but I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. We'll pick it up uh, next time. I just want to thank you guys for your patience. Any questions or comments? You guys want to make any comments, questions, challenges? You probably just want to get out, right? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I thought a lot about it. I think your, your basic presuppositions, your basic presuppositions, they can't be justified by something else. So I can't say to you God exists because something more epistemically certain proves that he exists. I can't do that. I can only say God exists because, because he's talked to me. Right? I don't know if it's the same thing or not. I'm not a world-class philosopher. But I'll tell you, I know God exists because he's talk, he has talked to me and, and I, I know that he has the ability to make himself known and understood. Um, now, if you want an argument for God's existence, I think one of the arguments, or a form of one of, the, uh, one of the arguments I could give is to say God is the only conceivable uh, foundation for rational inquiry. And since we're all doing rational inquiry, therefore God exists. I could argue something like that. Uh, it, it could be a, an inductive argument or it could be something more transcendental. But I think that's the flavor of my worldview, though. If, does that make sense to you? Yeah. I think God is the, he's the, the only explanatory option that, that exists for the preconditions of intelligibility. But is it circular? Some people think it's circular. I'm not sure if it's circular or if it's lineal because... When we're talking rationality, I say my rationality proceeds from God. In that sense, rationality is a very lineal thing. It's not circular at all. But it's for us to think about. There is a lecture that I meant to look at, and I should have because it would have been able to answer your question. But there's an apologist named Scott Elephant, I think his name is, Elephant. And he addresses this exact concern uh, that Van Til's apologetic is circular. And he denies circularity. Some people call it righteously circular. Um, Van Til called it spiral. John Frame sees that it's linear, going back to God's rationality. He doesn't see that it's necessarily circular. But all offense, I have to hear yet his response to that. How about I look at it this week and I'll get back to you and see what he says about the thing. How's that? Okay, I've got to remember now. Don't forget. <laughs> Any other... So the debate is on Saturday? Debate on Saturday, 7 o'clock. And yeah, let's have tons of people here. Is the uh, format of the debate already decided? Like, uh, yeah, I have, a, I have some flyers here. I can give you one. Yeah. And if, it, if I do a terrible job, I'm going to ask you all to look into the blue light. <laughs> but I'm trusting God. We're trusting God for wisdom here. And um, hey, last time we did this, a guy got saved. And family members of his got saved afterwards, and people are getting baptized now, and bringing Bibles into China now. And it's very exciting. A little catalyst, a little thing happening in this little church became a catalyst, right, under God. So very enthused to see God do something like that again. It would be wonderful. Okay. Okay, guys, why don't we pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, great God and Savior, we thank you, Lord, for this uh, time we could be together. I just ask you, God, to please, by your spirit, bless and protect uh, this dear class that comes out and help us, God, to be 
uh, growing in wisdom and in grace and in courage to best uh, love, honor, and serve you and to represent you to the world that uh, desperately needs to hear about you. We ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord.